starting a business on your own can be quite challenging because all of the decisions lie with you. You become so focused on your work and sometimes the balance just slightly rocks in the wrong direction. As entrepreneurs, a lot of people come from similar backgrounds and a lot of people have similar concerns when they start their business. I didn't have any experience and I really hardly had any money to start it up. So I was just thinking out of the box and seeing what was out there. The Business and IP Centre in London is really the start of a national rollout of Business and IP Centres throughout England. What we're doing is we're empowering people by giving them the knowledge that they need to make the right decision. We've got one of the largest business and information collections in the entire UK with experienced staff on hand to help our customers use these resources. The centre actually proves that the library is not only for academics but also for business people and provides very high quality resources to help entrepreneurs. We've got keynote reports, Mintel reports, which will enable them to do market research. We offer workshops, we offer one-to-one -one advice sessions. One that we attended and that was really useful was the one with the IP lawyer. We went there and learned how to protect our images and, uh, and uh, footage. People have come back and offered to speak at some of our events because they want to share the experience that they've had in the centre with other people. The most useful programme for me was the Innovating for Growth programme, which is designed to support owners of small businesses develop and grow their businesses and step outside of them and really look at them from a commercial and strategic perspective. It's always a fantastic experience to meet other entrepreneurs, share information, share doubt and success. It is the most phenomenal programme and it's helped me strip down my business, which is what I really wanted to do. If you're not sure where to begin or just need someone to talk to about your idea, the BIPC is a great place to start. Welcome to the British Library. It's very nice to see so many of you here. My name's Roly Keating. I'm Chief Exec here. Um, welcome to every single one of you in the room and also to anyone who may be live watching the live stream on Twitter, of course, uh, and also to uh, library audiences, um, uh, live audiences at libraries in Manchester and Worcester. Very, very good evening and welcome to part of our Inspiring Entrepreneurs season here at the library. And tonight, a very special evening with one of the key figures of the tech industry uh, worldwide, uh, a serial entrepreneur, co-founder and CEO of Twitter, uh, creator and founder of, uh, the S of Square, which um, launched in the UK last year, and we're gonna hear a lot about, I hope, tonight, uh, Jack Dorsey. And uh, Jack, we were talking just beforehand and about a shared uh, commitment to support businesses of all kinds, but particularly startups uh, and those who are just at that very, very earliest stage of their business idea and need support, need help, need advice and guidance. Here at the library we stand, our mantra is living knowledge and business support is part of that. We talk about uh, be it being our role to help businesses to innovate and grow. And we do it in many, many different ways. But about 10, 11 years ago, we converted one of the reading rooms here into a phrase you may have heard on that tape, BIPC, a business and IP center, because we wanted to unlock knowledge in a very, very specific way to help people who maybe just have the first germ of an idea, don't even know if they really are a business person, don't even know quite what that might mean, but we can provide the knowledge, the guidance, the advice, the market research, free at the point of use, that will really, really make a difference. And over that time, uh, we calculate we've had about, we've been able to help about 700,000 people, 120,000 new businesses have come out of that room uh, and in different ways, uh, very, very diverse sectors. And we like to think that there's something unusual about libraries. There are different kinds of business support, but libraries uh, have very low barriers to entry. People, they don't, they, you don't have to be dressed in a business suit to come to a library. Uh, and interestingly, uh, we've calculated that of the businesses coming out, of being incubated and supported by the BIPC, um, about 60% are owned by women, far above national average. 38% um, have BAME business owners. 
Uh, and in terms of longevity, there's a crucial, crucial statistic. Only 10% uh, of our alumni businesses um, fail after that pivotal third year. The national average is about 40%. So something we hope happens inside these walls um, that helps people get it right early on in the process, fail early, learn early, and that's been our philosophy. And since 2012, um, we have been working hard to make sure this is not just for people in London and the southeast. Um, and we've been rolling out to what is now 10 city partners, major city libraries uh, around the UK, uh, offering co-branded versions of the business and IP centre. You saw some of them in the little film uh, just then. And in the year ahead, we've got pilots in Glasgow, Cambridge, Nottingham, uh, and with an ambition to get to 20 business and IP centres around the country um, by 2020, uh, naturally enough. Um, that is it from me, but if you haven't uh, explored or made use of the facilities here, we very, very much hope you do. Programmes like tonight are absolutely part of the whole, um, the whole venture. Uh, we have many, many supporters and partners, particular thanks uh, to our sponsors, Cobra, beer, who will be lubricating the networking reception uh, afterwards, only for those of you in London, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, please do fill in uh, the feedback form. We really like any good business ourselves. We need feedback to make the service uh, better. I believe there is a little incentive. There's a prize drawer associated with tonight's featured product, so uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, but finally, uh, the pleasant, my pleasant task is to step back now and introduce our actual host for this evening's conversation with Jack, uh, another serial uh, entrepreneur in the tech space, founder, uh, maybe best known as the founder of the, the, the social enterprise, STEMETS, uh, STEM which has introduced, I think it's 18 and a half thousand uh, young girls between the age of five and, and 21 into the world of technology uh, and tech business. Uh, and only by ventures like that, may I say, uh, are we really going to change the landscape of technology. So uh, good on you for that. Please welcome Dr. Anne-Marie Imaphadin. Anne-Marie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roly, for that introduction. Thank you to everyone for being here and for to British Library as well for having myself and Jack here up on stage. Um, so this is tonight's Inspiring Entrepreneur session uh, with myself and Jack Dorsey. Um, it's a bit of a funny story, actually. It's a bit embarrassing. Jack and I are wearing the same thing. Um, <laughs> we're both in black and black and white trainers, which we didn't. We didn't coordinate, even though it, it looked like just great minds think alike. Um, so, so I'm Anne-Marie, and that's Jack, <laughs> for, for anyone that didn't know. Um, we, of course, are here as guests of the British Library and the IP Centre, um, and we are all about supporting uh, small businesses and new entrepreneurs. So just by a show of hands, to know who we have in the room, who here would consider themselves in the germination phase of their business? Kind of budding entrepreneur with the ideas bubbling. Okay, cool. How many of you are kind of in incubation, kind of starting almost out? And how many of you are butterflies or birds spreading your wings and flapping and having impact on the world? Okay. Is anyone, is the rest of you, are you awake? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to think who else is. The rest of you, are you, are there journalists here? <laughs> Boo. Okay, cool. Anyone from Cambridge Analytica here? Uh, you might, might not want to identify yourself. Okay, fantastic. So that hasn't really helped Jack and I know who's in the audience, but that, that's fine. Um, so being an entrepreneur, you get to do your eleva elevator pitch quite a lot and talk about what you do. Roly's already done mine. Um, this is Jack here. He's the co-founder of Square and another company that we're going to call the T Word and hopefully we won't mention at all during the next hour. Um, Jack, can you tell us what is Square? Um, Square, well, what is Square? Square is, um, I'll talk about our purpose. Okay, yep, that's fine. Answer um, your own questions, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, have some, I'll have some questions for you as well. <laughs> cool. Um, so our, our purpose is, uh, is to empower people into the economy. Um, and uh, like many companies, we started with one simple idea, and then we found the purpose by watching people use it. And it actually started with this. Um, this is a piece of glass art that my co-founder, Jim, who was my second boss after my mother, um, uh, made and tried to sell, but he couldn't sell because he couldn't accept a credit card. So we wanted to solve his problem. 
Um, he has many problems, but this one we, we <laughs> felt we could actually try to solve. And we were both talking to each other on our iPhones, and we have these you know, general purpose computers in our, in our hands next to our ears, and he asked a question, why couldn't I just make that sale? And uh, we both knew nothing about credit cards. We both knew nothing about building hardware. Um, we were both in credit card debt, actually. Um, and uh, we both came from St. Louis, Missouri. And, but we did know a thing or two about um, software. And we were comfortable in taking risk. And we were comfortable with learning and uh, doing whatever it takes to make it work, which to me is what entrepreneurship is. Um, so we, we gave ourselves a month and we built a prototype that plugged into the headphone jack and could actually swipe cards. We have um, mag stripes still in, in the United States. Um, so uh, that converted the audio track on the back of every credit card to a sound um, that uh, was then interpreted by software that can convert it to numbers. And those numbers could go to a bank to actually process payments off of that card. Um, and it worked. It worked in a month, and I could go around to people and start taking money from people from their credit cards, which was awesome. And, um, <laughs> and then uh, we showed it to more people, and we asked if they would use it, and they would have a need. And uh, a lot of them initially said no. Um, they said, I don't have, I don't want to ac accept credit cards. Um, I don't think it's useful for my, my business. I think it's too expensive. I tried before, and I was denied by the bank. Um, so we, uh, we, we continued to persist and continue to ask, and we noticed the real purpose of what we built was um, not to accept credit cards, but to help uh, an individual make a sale. And if they could make a sale, if they could accept a credit card, they could actually participate in the economy. The economy in the United States was moving away from paper cash and moving towards plastic. And for those sellers who had access to accepting plastic, they could make the sale. For those who didn't, they were losing more and more sales. And even for those who could accept credit cards, they were being treated pretty unfairly um, by the financial institutions, um, by obscurity of information. So we, um, we, we, we built uh, up from the prototype into something that we could actually scale. And this was about nine years ago. And, um, and it just resonated, it just hit. Um, but um, we, we then you know, really focused on what is the most important thing that we can do to grow our customers? Like we have all these sellers, we have all these small businesses um, and they wanna grow and all we have to focus on is helping them grow because if they grow, then we grow as well, which is an amazing business model. We have perfect alignment of incentives with, with our customers. So, um, we looked at the next most important thing, and it was organizing information around their business, which was a register, a point of sale. Looked at the next most, and it was lending them money, square capital. So we've managed to build this ecosystem of financial services with the sole goal of helping a seller grow. Um, and uh, it's, been, it's been really amazing to um, watch some of our sellers grow from one individual to multiple locations. And, not just in the United States, but uh, uh, in Australia and Japan and uh, the UK uh, and, and Canada, those are the markets that we're in. So um, we added one more dimension to our company not too long ago, which is around individuals and providing individuals financial services. Um, mo the majority of this is through an application we, called, we call Cash. Um, it's called the Cash app or Square Cash. And um, we have seen people use it as their bank account now. And we are serving and underserved in the United States and underbanked in the United States in the same way that we were serving and underserved in, um, uh, for a seller uh, in, the, in the U.S. as well. So um, our purpose is to uh, empower people in the economy and, and build simple tools that enable people to participate. And we believe we have a responsibility to guide people towards, um, uh, towards whatever their ambition is, whatever, whatever that is. But... Uh, ideally towards uh, a healthier relationship with their money um, and, uh, and how they actually run their business as well. So a healthy relationship with money is quite important in terms of business, uh, but you said you've been running for nine years. So technology that you described as kind of mag the magnetic strip, 
um, which we don't use anymore in the UK, because we're a little bit more advanced than our cousins um, in the US. But I wanted to know, um, you know, there are new technologies that have now become more widespread um, and are more developed now, things like machine learning, AI. How has that transformed what Square has been able to do and, and provide as a business? Well, after we built the, after, after we built the reader, um, that was really the easy part. Um, the, the hardest part was realizing that this whole industry was very exclusionary. Um, and it was exclusionary because it had um, only one, in the US case, it had only one tool to vet um, identity and authenticity of, of someone. And that was a credit check. So the only way you could start accepting credit cards um, before Square uh, was to actually um, submit to a credit check, a FICA score. And as many of you know, um, a lot of entrepreneurs don't have the best credit and they don't have, or even credit history at all. Um, so they were being denied. Jim and I, my co-founder, uh, had terrible credit, <laughs> really, really terrible credit. Um, and uh, we were denied from getting a merchant account in the first place. Little did they know, right? <laughs> yeah, well, the way we got through is we lied. Uh, we lied about <laughs> what we were doing. Um, and, uh, you That's know, it's... Not, that advice is not uh, supported <laughs> by the British Library. You have to take a risk to make it, make it, make it work. Um, and we, we took that risk. Um, and uh, so what we found was that only about 30% of the people who went to a bank to apply to accept credit cards actually made it through. And, um, and we realized it was because the whole system was designed to not trust anyone coming in. And the whole system was in place so that you could uh, hit through these barriers. And when you get to the other side, you're still not trusted. So we said, we're going to do something a little bit different. One, we're going to change our mindset. We're going to trust everyone. And we're going to include as many people as possible. And then two, we're going to apply technology to it, specifically data science, which now is known as machine learning, deep learning, and artificial intelligence. And um, we applied that um, to uh, more data and better data um, that was not necessarily a credit check, which is the, a terrible, terrible indicator of uh, your ability to accept credit cards. So by doing that, those two things, changing our mindset towards trust, and then um, uh, changing the technology and using just present day technology, we went from 30% to 99%. So 99% of people who download Square to accept credit cards actually start swiping cards um, and, uh, and processing payments. So um, now that doesn't mean we, you know, we and, and we kept this trust up, but we also watch if, you can continue to contribute in a positive way, then we continue to do things that will help you grow. If you detract or you do anything illegal or you try to defraud or distract, then we ask you to leave. Um, so it's just a different mindset um, that really changed us and changed the industry, we believe, um, and, and ultimately enabled more people to participate. Uh, which is what we want to do and what our purpose is. So it's disrupting the credit agencies, kind of their way of working as well, their algorithms and their assumptions, but also the, the banking sector, really. And yeah, yeah, spe specifically in this case, the merchant acquirers. Um, but we've gone way past that. Now, you know, we're, we have a lending business and we have a, we have a, we have a, a, a service called, as I said, Square Cash, where people are actually using it as their bank account. They're storing money with us. We issue them a card that has Visa branded, so you can use it anywhere Visa is accepted. You can go to an ATM, get actual paper money out. Um, you can direct deposit your check to it. So they're downloading it and actually using it as their bank account, which is uh, amazing, because we are, we are serving folks who have been excluded from uh, banks and financial institutions generally. Um, and we've done so in a way that we've partnered with the banks to get there. So we don't want to replace a bank. We don't want to replace a financial institution or a network. We want to make what they have, which works, more accessible. Um, and, and that is a word that really represents Square is access. Um, we, we, we believe that we can provide more access to more people um, and, uh, and do so in a, a fair and simple and transparent and fast way. And you've been doing that and extending your offering uh, as well for entrepreneurs and for small businesses in particular. So there's a there's a new thing that we've got coming out shortly, an exclusive. This I think is where we I have. Make the this is where you make the announcement, okay. Jack. Yes. Thank you for the thank you for the cue. Every time. <laughs> um, so uh, one of our fastest growing services um, 
in the United States uh, has been this product we call instant deposit. And what it is, is um, typically when you, uh, when you accept a credit card payment, a merchant doesn't get access to that money for a week after the payment. Um, in the best case, it's usually two to three days. And for all of you who are starting businesses or run businesses, you know how um, closely um, you keep everything. You, 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 you bring money in and then you immediately spend it when you first get going. Uh, because of all these needs, because of marketing, because of buying equipment, buying inventory, paying people. Um, so we realized very early on the importance of quickly delivering access to money. So one of the things we did, which was a massive risk for us and really scary, was we decided that um, we were going to commit to uh, delivering people's money next business day. Um, and uh, the problem with that is that we weren't paid by the banks for two to three days. So we were giving people money that we didn't have. Um, and we wanted that to be possible, so what do you do when you want something to be possible? You figure out what technology will make it possible. So we built that technology. It required a lot of uh, data science, machine learning, and whatnot. And uh, we were taking out these massive loans every single day from banks to pay out all of our sellers next business day um, because speed and access to funds is so important. So then we took it a step further and we said, what if we could actually do it instantly? So anytime after a credit card is taken, you can actually hit a button and it goes into your account instantly so that you can use it instantly. Um, you can go to the ATM and actually get the money out or you can spend it right there on whatever you need. Wouldn't that be cool? So we did that in the US and it's been one of our fastest growing services and uh, today we're, we're launching it in the UK. Um, and this is, um, thank you. It's not a roaring round of applause because it seems quite simple and obvious, but <laughs> if, you, if you actually give this capability to um, sellers, um, it is just so important. It's just the flexibility that one has around getting access to their money. And it, again, it feels like everyone should have instant access to their money, but they don't. Um, and it's because of all of these um, older technologies or older approaches in the industry um, that have not been questioned, that we just questioned and also we took some risk on. Um, and again, because we do this instantly, we're pushing money out that uh, we don't have uh, because we haven't been paid by the banks in, the, in that particular case. But we, we believe it's important enough um, and it's actually proving to be important enough because it is our fastest growing. We like risk as entrepreneurs, not lying, but we, we, like we do like risk. Um, <laughs> how many of you, Square has been in the UK for a year now. How many of you are Square customers? Yeah, by show of hands, well, Thank just you. Emma. Oh, okay, Emma <laughs> there as well. Fantastic. Thank you, How many of you are now considering it after Jack's very passionate? There you go. So it's working. Thank it's you. working. <laughs> okay. we'll, we'll keep going. Um, so, so you said you don't want to replace banks um, and you're relying on their infrastructure quite a lot. So for you, what is the definition or what should the definition of a bank be going forward if you know, Square is going to be able to, to kind of almost fill the gaps of the things that they don't do? What should be the remit of the bank or what do you see banks as? What's their role? How many of you have read or heard of uh, Clay Christensen? Clay Christensen. Um, so he, uh, he's a professor at Harvard, and he wrote this amazing paper, which expanded into a book um, about a philosophy, about a system called Jobs to be Done. Um, and uh, he asked a very simple question of why do I hire this service, or why do I hire this product? So taken to an extreme, why do I hire this glass of water? Um, what are the criteria for which I hire this glass of water? And it gets you thinking about um, uh, what the competition for water is. So if I'm hiring it because I'm thirsty, you immediately think about all the other things that could quench my thirst. If I'm hiring it because I'm nervous and I want something to hold, you can immediately think of all the other things that would ease my nerves um, uh, that I could hold in my hand or, or something else that could ease my nerves to, to be hired for that particular job. So the way I would like to think about banks is not the category or the label of what they are, but in fact what they're hired for. So I believe that banks ultimately, in a, in a noble sense, should be hired because people want help. They want help achieving some dream they have, whether that be from a business standpoint or from an individual standpoint. So I need help sending my child to college. 
Um, I need help uh, buying a new car. I need help buying a house. I need help starting my business. I need help processing credit cards. And um, when you look at it through that dimension, then there are so many creative solutions you can um, push against those particular jobs. So ultimately, I do believe that banks have a significant role in the future if they really focus on what their job is. Um, uh, I need help storing my money securely. And then <laughs> how does that, how does that, um, how does technology today make that more secure or more creative or more innovative? Uh, and you know, if you ask that question, for instance, how do I store my money securely? You may end up around something like the blockchain. Um, where now the, now the bank is thinking about these technologies that are important to uh, actually focusing on what job they're serving instead of uh, the profit they're trying to maximi maximize or the, or the business they're trying to grow. So as long as we um, think about um, the jobs we're, we're doing first and foremost and, and, and that puts you in a, in a customer-oriented uh, mindset, um, then I, I think we're doing the right thing. So I don't want to replace banks because I, I want to serve a job. Mm -hmm. And I want to serve the job of helping people make the sale. And, um, and there's multiple ways to make that sale. We, just another example of this, we could have um, stopped at saying, we want to help people accept credit cards. And we realized that was actually the wrong job. The right job for us is we want to help uh, small businesses grow. And now there's a whole host of solutions uh, that you can go against that. So credit cards is just one. Point of sale and helping people make decisions around their data is another one. Square Capital, which is a lending business, is another one. Uh, customer relationship management is another one. They all help a business grow. So it really broadened the field for us. And that made us um, be a company that wasn't just focused on one tiny thing that only had uh, reach um, that served a particular need, but but actually could go anywhere. Um, and, uh, and, and that, that has been important. So um, my, my sense is that um, we focus on our jobs and then we look at what is needed to, s to serve those jobs in the most creative and innovative way. And in our case, partnership with a bank was the fastest way we could move and also the best way we could move. Um, replacing the bank uh, would have been extremely challenging and probably slowed us down and probably would have pissed a bunch of people off and that would have added a bunch of friction as well. So um, I, you know, I, I, the most important thing for, for me and our company is that we really focus on the job we're serving and who we're serving in the context that they find themselves in because we can get really creative around that. And if you haven't read the book, um, there's, it, there's a white paper on jobs to be done, um, but there's a book called Competing Against Luck, um, which has a lot of very specific examples around using this framework to think about ideas and to think about building products and services um, that are more customer focused and not reactive to customer needs, but actually looking at patterns. Um, um, uh, an interesting example of this is the milkshake. So he was asked to help uh, a fast food restaurant sell more milkshakes. And he went in and he started surveying and, and just watching behaviors. And he did something was, which was very interesting. He went in all day, so from the morning into the evening, and he watched people purchase. And one of the things he noticed was people were buying milkshakes in the morning. And he asked a question like, why are you hiring that milkshake? And the people were like, what are you talking about? I'm not <laughs> hiring a milkshake. <laughs> and, uh, but, and then he persisted, why are you hiring the, the milkshake? And it, it makes people think in a very different way. And they said, well, you know, I have a long commute. And it's about 30 minutes. And I get bored easily. And this, is, this lasts for a long time. So because I suck it through the straw and it's really thick, it lasts for my whole drive. And it doesn't spill, it doesn't get messy like a croissant. It's not awkward like a, like a banana. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it tastes good and it's kind of entertaining. Um, he didn't ask about the health question, but you know, it's, it's, it's what people wanted. So the insight from that is people want something, the hiring criteria they make for the milkshake is they want something that lasts and they want something that is entertaining, and they want something that is well-contained so it doesn't get all over the car when they're, they're driving. So now you can offer a host of actual bre breakfast items that meet that hiring criteria, um, and it opens the whole market uh, for, for this restaurant. So um, it's just really 
simple and clever, um, but I, I definitely recommend it. People are weird, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. It's also a great, a great That's new, you. yeah, a great uh, redefining the word hiring there as well. The whole every time you say hiring, I think of making it more higher. I don't know if anyone else <laughs> is in is in the English is my first language, so it's fine. Um, I used to work at a bank. Um, I used to work in, uh, in a universal bank, so we had investment and retail. And I think the interesting thing that I see now has been this kind of this hiring criteria, but also the job and the, the what is the problem that you're solving. So I think banks almost got stuck in this kind of old way of thinking. And so we've had this cottage industry or this industry, actually, now it's not, no longer in the cottages, this fintech industry, which is booming. Um, I'm sure you'll have heard that London is... Is, a, is a, a hub, a global hub for fintech industry. So I wonder, is there anything other than what you're doing with Square that you see that's quite exciting in terms of fintech and the way that technology is being used to solve some of these problems that banks have kind of ignored over time? Um, slash, do you want to say something about digital currency, currencies and blockchain? Because <laughs> you've got to, got to throw that one in. Answer. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um. Uh, well, I think the most exciting, I mean, I, I think there's a real opportunity to, one, provide more access to people. Um, and, and that certainly digital currency has that potential. Uh, I think it's one of the greatest levers um, that, that I've seen from a technology standpoint to enable more people to participate. Um, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. The, um, I think there's a real opportunity around um, guiding people towards more financial health um, and, uh, you know, having... Uh, advisors built into like some of the apps that we're we're building, I think is important. And uh, um, you know, people are, aren't always going to choose financial health, but it is our responsibility to make sure that they have all the information to make an informed decision. Like what biological they're doing. health, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. same. Um, so I, I think the, those there's a there's a number of companies looking at, at that and like how do how do we guide people towards more financial health? Um, I think uh, you know anything that we can do um, to uh, bring banking services and financial services uh, to people who have been locked out, don't have a bank account today, um, don't have uh, any credit file whatsoever, um, and leveling the playing field for them, we all get better for it because we see more creative ideas um, and we see more participation. So. Um, I tend to drive towards more of those technologies and those companies, and there's a, there's a number of them um, uh, here in the UK as well. Um, so, on the on the blockchain and and on digital currency, it's something I'm really optimistic about, and something I'm excited about. Uh, I how many of you read the the Bitcoin white paper? If you haven't, it's um, I think it's nine pages. Um, and it's uh, the, just the introduction. If you, if you don't make it through all the math and the cryptography, the introduction is, is, is pretty stunning. The, the philosophies behind it um, are, are amazing. You know, build a deflationary currency that incentivizes saving, um, that um, is meant for the world, um, is meant um, to not be controlled by any centralized institution, um, and is uh, meant to build trust in trustless environments is really powerful. I think it's one of the most seminal works of computer science in the past 20 years. Independent of what you think of Bitcoin and the manifestation of it today, uh, there's really amazing technology within within uh, the blockchain and, and within this paper. Um, if you look at the history of computing, everything has been decentralized. All power comes from decentralization. And the internet has had this uh, in our, our ability and understanding to be able to coordinate computers together and to, to talk with one another. And then we saw the same thing with cloud data where we were able to suddenly coordinate data across multiple computers uh, so that it looked like one uh, stream and one, one piece of data. Um, and then um, you know the uh, cloud computing, the ability to coordinate um, CPUs across multiple um, data centers and CPUs and, and calculations across multiple CPUs. Um, and all this benefits us because uh, it removes single points of failure, it increases reliability, uh, and all that can increase trust. Uh, so the ledger, uh, which is an accounting uh, tool and metaphor, um, has never been decentralized until the blockchain. Um, and uh, the ledgers certainly are great for financial applications, 
but they also have applications in trust and identity as well. So these technologies can be used much more than just um, for payments companies. Mm -hmm. um, they can be used for uh, almost any company you can imagine um, to make their work more efficient, to make their work more trusted. Um, and I think we're, we're just getting to the start of what's possible with these technologies. So I'm, I'm really optimistic and, and really excited. But I, me personally, I, I believe that um, the internet wants and deserves it, its own currency. Um, that is global, that is free, that is electronic, that is convenient, that is decentralized as the internet is. And uh, I believe that it will be Bitcoin. There are others who believe it will be other cryptocurrencies, but I, I think Bitcoin has a very small surface area, which uh, makes it uh, the potential of it a lot more secure, um, less prone to attack. And it's been through a lot. It's been tested a lot. Um, it has a brand name. Um, I'm always surprised. Four years ago, Three years ago, two years ago, I am from St. Louis, Missouri, and I have a lot of uh, people in my life who um, stay away from technology, and all of them were asking me about Bitcoin, and I'm like, well, how do you how do you know about Bitcoin? And they and they answer like I, I heard, I can buy it like gold, um, and uh, I can um, you know I can I can save it, and I know it's going to go up and down, but I'll save it for a long time, and potentially I can sell it when I make a little bit of money. So. Um, they weren't seeing it as a currency, they were seeing it as a digital asset. And that's how it's being used today. Uh, I don't think that's how it's always going to be used, but today that is how it is, is being used and, and, and that's what we're, we're learning from. So um, I believe in its power as an actual currency for the world and for the internet. Um, and I think it's uh, extremely freeing in that sense. Another thing for your notes there, kind of branding is very important. <laughs> For, for business. Um, so we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about leadership and entrepreneurialism, because um, Jack is an entrepreneur, just in case anyone didn't know that. You are a serial entrepreneur. Um, so how do you, what's your process? How do you evaluate ideas and decide on what to build? Um, but also what failures have you had that you've learned from the most in that process? <clears throat> well, I've never wanted to be an entrepreneur. Like, I didn't grow up that way, and I never wanted to be CEO. I never wanted to build a company. I never wanted to be an engineer. Never wanted to program. Um, what did you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> um, when, when I was a kid, I was fascinated by cities and how they worked. And I wanted to visualize them. I wanted to be able to visualize them. So I was obsessed with maps when I was a kid. And uh, when my dad got a computer, um, I realized that I could draw a map on the computer, but I had no idea how. So I was fortunate in that I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, which actually had a very large hacker culture. And the hacker culture, the best aspects of the hacker culture is a lot of openness and a lot of sharing. Um, best manifest in Linux, the operating system, which really started the open source uh, movement. Um, not started it, but, but really amplified it in, in, in a way that needed to be. So. I learned from open source how to program, and I didn't want to program, I wanted to draw a map. So I just identified what problem I wanted to get done, and, and then we lived next to the highway, and my parents had a, a CB radio, and I would always listen to the trucks, and they also had a police scanner, and I'd always listen to the police and the ambulances. And uh, they would always do something which was interesting, they would always say where they were, what they're doing, and where they're going. Um, and uh, I wanted to then take that information, put it into my program, so I could actually plot them on my map, and I could then see them. And then uh, I kept doing that, and I kept adding more data sources, and I realized that there was a whole industry around this called dispatch. Um, so then I found the biggest dispatch firm in the world, which happened to be in New York, and had a huge uh, presence in London as well. It was called Dispatch Management Services, and I was really good at computers at that time, so I um, uh, found a, a security flaw in their servers, um, <laughs> and I found the email list for their uh, chairman and their CEO, and I said, there's a problem with your server, it's insecure, and here's how to fix it, and by the way, I write dispatch software, and can I have a job? <laughs> um, and they hired me a week after that, and <laughs> I got in, and some for some reason they continued to trust me, and then I started a company. Um, I started a company around dispatch. And we moved to San Francisco in 99. Started a company around dispatch, and it was a complete failure. 
Um, we just weren't um, customer focused. We, you know, the, the bubble was happening at that time. Um, we didn't flesh enough of the idea out. Um, we didn't have enough to show for what we were doing. Um, we didn't approach investors with real customers. Um, so it went out of business. It was a complete failure. I went back to contracting. Um, and uh, I did that for years uh, until um, 2006 when I joined another company. Um, and then it was called um, Riverbed, and I quickly realized I didn't want to be an enterprise. So I only lasted there three months, and I found a, another company called Odeo, which was a podcasting company. And, um, and that's where, where Twitter was born, based on that dispatch idea of showing where you are and what you're doing and what you're thinking and whatnot. Um, so for, for me, um, my life has always been about um, understanding that I know nothing and I need to go figure it out to take the next step. So I didn't want to be a CEO, but I had to be in order to continue to grow, uh, at that time, Twitter, and after that, Square. I didn't know how to raise money, but I had to. Um, and I've always found that if I can show some of that vulnerability, um, it really builds a lot, of, a lot of trust, but it allows me to learn much faster. So one of the creative things that we did at Square when we were first pitching investors is we didn't want to show up to any investor unless we had a working product. Um, so our working product was amazing because to show investors, our potential investors, what our product was, I asked for their credit cards. And I would take money off their cards. And, um, and when I didn't really feel great about the person, I would take a lot more. <laughs> um, so sometimes I would take $5, and sometimes I would take $500, and I would give them an opportunity. I can, like, you know, refund you, but they said, no, keep it. And we had a good dinner that night. Yeah. <laughs> good dinner that night. And um, so that was, that was really useful because being able to show something instead of tell it, uh, people then start completing the sentence. And when we were, sh like, people, when they saw the credit card swipe through the phone and the reader, the first thing they said was, wow. And then they realized I just took their money, and they're like, wait, how much did you take? <laughs> and, then, and then they said, wow, you know, my, baby sh my babysitter could use this. Or the taxi I take all the time could use this. Or, and then when you get their imagination going, um, then they're more leaned into like, I want to invest. So the second thing we did is like, wait, 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 that's amazing, but here's over 100 reasons why we're going to fail, why this is a, the worst idea ever. And number one, we know nothing about the credit card industry. Number two, we're in credit card debt. <laughs> number three, we don't know how to build hardware. Number four, PayPal will probably kill us. Um, they'll probably outcompete us. Uh, number five, and the list went on. We, we went after nine that we addressed went line by line. And we showed up front the risk, and we talked about and articulated what we were going to do to make it work. And to me, that's the definition of entrepreneurship, is you do whatever it takes to make it work, um, within lo local law, of course. <laughs> um, so we, we made, you know, we, we just constantly, you know, another level approaches, and I don't know how to do something, and I know I don't know how to do it. I admit it to myself, and then I learn. Um, so... I um, so 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 that to me is it is, is just being able to be self-aware about what you know and what you don't know, and to lean really healthily into what you don't know and be really uncomfortable, um, and uh, and be open to making a ton of mistakes along the way. Like we made a ton of mistakes when we were first making the hardware. We had no idea what we were doing. Um, we were glue hand gluing them together, and uh, it. Probably was it probably wasn't healthy or good, but you know we we did what we had to do um, to to make it work in the early days, and then you figure it out and you and you scale it. Um, so everything I've done um, since that original program is not something I ever imagined my myself doing, but I did it in service of making sure I can bring this idea to the world um, because that's what I enjoy. I, I enjoy and love and um, get inspired by building tools that empower people to make them bigger than themselves. Um, and that has you know, been the story of Square, it's been the story of Twitter, and um, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, Twitter. What yeah, do I'm do? gonna give you a, a warning. We said Twitter, we said we weren't allowed to use the word <laughs> Twitter. 
the T word. You said it five times in that last answer. Sorry, we can use Jack, the word. That's your first warning. Um, so you mentioned you didn't want to be a leader, and, and being a CEO and all this stuff wasn't things, weren't things that you wanted to do. Um, but you have ended up being a leader in, in the technology industry via various companies that you run. Um, and so it means that you're able to set an example. It means you've got um, power to be able to change the way things are. Um, my job at the moment is is running Stemets, which is a little about. Talk more more about your work. Let's talk about it a little bit, a little bit. But this is this is about you. Um, <laughs> so my job is, is running Stemets um, and encouraging girls and young women into an industry where we don't have as many as we should do. We don't have anywhere near parity, um, and it's an industry that's quite new. So it's interesting or it's weird actually that we've got this kind of all the bad things maybe that we've got in the wider society kind of multiplied within the industry. So we've got this problem of. Um, not having enough minorities, not having enough women. In the UK, it's 17%. I know the US mirrors that proportion of, of women in the industry. What are you doing? What have you done to be a leader in this space and to make sure that we've got better representation of women and minorities in tech? Well, I think the, the most important thing is um, being able to see what you want to be. Um, and uh, one of the things I'm really proud of uh, as Square is the majority of our company reports up to just three women. Um, and uh, the roles that men traditionally take in companies like ours, CFO, um, uh, head of our seller business, which is effectively our head of engineering, um, head of our capital business, all women, our GC uh, women. Um, so um, I, I think you know, we need to really push to make sure that at every level um, that people are seeing uh, what the potential uh, is and what they, what they could be. Um, so Tara Fryer is, is actually from Ireland. Uh, she's our CFO at Square. Um, and she is a phenomenal person, um, a phenomenal leader. Um, and at the same time, she's not constrained to her role. Um, and that's another thing that I want to make sure that we're doing as a company, is that we're not setting expectation of, if you're a CFO, you're a CFO. Um, then you can't have an opinion on the product. Um, one of our first conversations uh, was uh, around Sarah having a lot of opinions on the, on the product. Um, and uh, it was amazing uh, because she's on the other side. She buys from our sellers and she has a strong sense of what felt great and what didn't. Um, she also uh, helped us create the Square Capital business. Um, she found an insight of like, we're, you know, the, the story I told earlier of like being able to push money out to people that we don't have uh, next business day. We're reactively lending people money. So we react to um, uh, taking a credit card uh, and we know that money is going to come our way, but what if we could actually lend that money proactively? So Square Capital came out of her question uh, and she created an entire business line uh, from, that, from that question. Now she's running uh, our payroll um, uh, product, which right now is only in the United States, but continues to, to ask those questions. So not only is she our CFO, and I think one of the most amazing CFOs in the world, but um, she is also an entrepreneur within a company that started nine years ago. Um, so that's what I want to do more of. Um, and the other thing that um, we're, we're doing is sometimes people come in for roles like support um, or roles like risk and compliance. Um, but they have an ambition of being an engineer or, or being a designer. So oftentimes this, uh, this quote-unquote pipeline is talked about. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that I don't think companies realize enough is they have all these people in their companies who have all this amazing ambition that want to step above being a customer support agent. They want to learn how to program. They want to contribute to their, to their tools. Um, so one of the things that we could do is actually not rely upon um, someone going to a college to learn a particular skill or learn this in high school, but actually train our own people how to program or how to design. Um, and we did that in St. Louis, actually. So I'm from St. Louis, and it was really important for, for me and Jim to have presence within St. Louis when, when we could do it, when we could actually afford to do it and, uh, and we could scale it. And we now have close to um, 400 people in St. Louis. Um, and a lot of them are supporters and um, work in risk and sales. And I was back there and I asked a question like, if we were to offer you training to become a designer or an engineer, 
how many of you would take it? And every single person in that room put their hand up. Um, and we did a small test with a, with a small group and actually went through it and um, are now contributing and are engineers um, and, and learning. So there's a ton of solutions to, to change the, the mixer and we just have to be really creative and really push ourselves. The only way we're going to build a business of relevance is to have diversity of perspective and diversity of background. That's the only way. If we want to serve the world, we have to be the world. Um, and you know, there's, it's not just from a service standpoint, it's from the actual business standpoint as well. So it is a business reason and a business imperative that, w that we do this. But I found that the, the most impactful have been um, being really open to anyone's background and, and investing in, in their growth and their career development and also making sure that we have leadership that people aspire to be and can see clearly um, and that they're constantly telling their, their stories around what they overcame and, and, uh, and what they want to achieve and, and what they want to do, do more of. Um, and, uh, and then reaching out to uh, programs like yours. We, we work with uh, Girls Who Code uh, in the States um, and we host um, uh, a bunch of uh, women uh, in college and, and also high school to come into our offices um, to uh, do an intensive with our engineers uh, to help them learn how to, not just to engineer, but to build, uh, to create. And to me, even though I didn't want to become an engineer, the thing that it gave me that um, I'm so grateful for is confidence. Because I was able to go from a complete blank slate and nothing at all, like empty space, and create something by myself that someone else could use. That feels so empowering. Um, and if you can have someone experience that, it gets really infectious. And then it just goes, right? Then they just like, okay, give me all the information, what's next? But it's, it's that one first like little spark and click uh, that changes things. So that's, that's what got me into it. Yeah. Building, it was a database coincidentally, but building a database that someone else was able to use, store the information and retrieve it without me being there, still blows my mind till today. Um, you mentioned they're kind of getting involved with Girls Who Code. Stemets could be a potential partner. Yes. We, should, we should, yes. should work something. There's all these witnesses and there's yes. a, Where's the photographer? <laughs> Handshake there. Um, the world is watching. There we go. Um, a segue, a little bit from something you just said there, actually. Have you seen the movie Hidden Figures? No. No? <laughs> I don't know what to say. I'm just going to... Um, so, Hidden Figures was a, was a movie. Uh, so, uh, what's another one you might have seen? Gosh, I, I didn't know. No one's taking you to see, to see Hidden Figures. No one likes you. Is that what that... Um, so, Hidden Figures is a great film that came out last year. Pharrell did the score for it. And it's all about uh, the women of NASA in the 1960s and tells their story. Do you remember it now? I remember hearing it. I, I do want to see it. I don't want to... <laughs> I don't, I don't watch a lot of movies. Um, no, if so. there's any you're going to watch, it's that one. What I, the question I wanted to ask... I, I benefit from recommendations. Um, so normally people ask, you know, who would play you in a movie of your life? They've not, they're not making a movie yet, are they? Not that no, I'm not that of. you know. Um, better than that question is, who would you like to see a movie made of? Which hidden figure, which woman in STEM or in tech would you like to see a movie made of? It might be Sarah, it might be someone else. Hmm. Given you've not seen hidden figures, I don't know that you have a template to compare it to, but... In, in tech? Yeah, in or, or otherwise. Who's a woman's story that you'd like to see, see told on, on, that you would go and see if they put it on in the cinemas? Um, hmm. It is tricky, isn't it? Tough questions, that's what I'm here for. I mean, so, so very close to me. Um, I, would, I would love to see a movie on Sarah because she's come through a lot. Um, and... Uh, is definitely a fighter. And, and the other one that is close to me in technology is our, our GC at, at Twitter, um, Vidya, um, who is a fighter. Uh, and uh, she is just an amazing force in the world. Um, and I think she has a really amazing story to tell. Um, out, outside of those circles, you know, it, it's interesting because I, I think um, I'm seeing a lot of uh, women in crypto in particular. Um, and um, there's a lot of pretty, uh, I'd like to see at least a movie about that because it is so on the edge right now. 
And, uh, and there is a very quickly growing community of women in crypto. Um, one of the companies um, I invested in uh, is this company called Lightning. Um, and they in their goal is to make Bitcoin transactional. And it's, one, it's run by this amazing woman named Elizabeth Stark. Um, and uh, she um, is uh, just a, a, a trailblazer, like just taking a bunch of risk, but um, is also building up this, this, uh, this community of, of women in crypto. And I think there's a lot of uh, hidden figures within that community um, who may not want to be known, um, who may want to be known, but are, are not finding the right platforms or the right amplification. Um, but um, there's a there's a lot of a lot of women in crypto that I follow uh, on Twitter, um, which has a huge crypto community um, that I think would be a fascinating story in in time. I, I think there's still a lot of uh, a, a lot of interestingness and excitement coming uh, coming our way from crypto. Um, but that to me, I, I would want to see something like on the edge uh, and uh, and people who are really defining the space and folks like Elizabeth. You know, she's defining the space. She's going to help define how Bitcoin will actually be used around the world. And she's assembled this amazing team of cryptographers. And they're not just in the US, they're all over. Like the, a lot of the blockchain folks and the crypto folks are actually in Paris. Um, and uh, so there's this huge growing community around crypto and blockchain in, in Paris. I only know this from Elizabeth um, because she told me about a, a crypto conference in Paris that she was presenting at. And she said, yeah, well, all the talent, um, there's a lot of the talent in, in Paris. Um, and uh, it's really exciting because Paris is a, an amazing city as well. Mm. Um, so um, that, that would probably be the movie outside of the people I know. Yeah, cool. All right. So um, we're almost going to audience Q&A. We've got a hashtag. Uh, there you go, down the bottom. Hashtag BL Jack Dorsey if you've got any questions. Um, and that goes for you in Manchester and Worcester as well, who are joining us via the live feed. I'm going to do a quick fire round for you, Jack. Kind of short uh, answers, just maybe just one word, and then we'll go out um, to the audience with their questions. Um, savory or sweet? Both. <laughs> Early riser or late to bed? Don't say both, no. <laughs> it's not how this goes. Some nights both. I mean, some nights both. But I like, I like waking up early because I, one of the tricks I found personally is um, I, I have this routine in the morning and I wake up and I meditate and then I do physical exercise and then I don't check my phone uh, until um, around 7.30 in the morning. I catch up quickly uh, and then um, I walk to work. It's five miles. What is that in... In kilometers. We do miles here, it's fine. We do miles. Oh, yeah. that's right. Um, eight, eight kilometers. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I walk five miles and I listen to a podcast or audiobook. So in the first three hours of my day, uh, I've invested a lot in myself. So I've cleared my mind, gotten calm. I've done something physically um, to maintain my health and to grow my health. And I've learned something. So no matter what happens during the day, no matter how bad my day is, I always feel like I won already, because I started the day with a massive win. Um, and it just changes the psychology a bit, um, and it's been really impactful for me. So I like getting up early so I can do that, because if I, if I don't, then I feel like I'm just kind of immediately going into reactive mode, uh, and then not on my schedule. Sorry, that's not quick. The, I was going to say. <laughs> early riser was your answer, Jack, but that's fine. Uh, cats, or, cats or dogs? Both. I knew you were going to say it. <laughs> Chinchillas, actually. Chinchillas? Chinchillas, yeah, that's, okay. that's the pet I had. Um, who's your favorite artist or, uh, or band, musically? Um, they're one person, uh, Kendrick Lamar. I think he's a, the greatest poet of this generation. and um, He's an artist, he's a musician, he's a poet. Uh, he's, uh, he's amazing. Any other Lamarites? I don't know what they're called. <laughs> Ken Hive in the room, no? <laughs> Um, and then finally, would you rather be attacked by one horse-sized duck or a hundred duck-sized horses? One horse uh, <laughs> um, neither. <laughs> Doesn't get the rules, this guy. It's fine. He's a disruptor. Uh, questions from the audience. Claire, where is Claire? 
Hello, Claire. Do we have questions from Twitter? Uh, uh, yes, we have got some um, questions. Um, there's been a good one from Matthew Stafford, who's been watching, and he he is very impressed so far with your businesses that you've brought up <laughs> to the world. But he's asked, what are you still aiming for in life? Keeping you humble. Um, <clears throat> I I mean I I I thrive. Um, like I, I think I'm a tool maker. Like that, that is my job, um, and uh, that's what I love doing. I love making tools that empower people, um, and uh, I, you know, I want to work on something fundamental. Um, communication is fundamental. Um, uh, transferring money, commerce is fundamental, and if you focus on fundamental problems, everything above it gets better. Um, so. Uh, because we focus on conversation, we can have uh, we can make fast progress, and we can see what needs to be changed and acknowledged in the world. And because we focus on making um, uh, commerce approachable and easy for folks, and uh, empowering people in the economy, uh, people can have livelihoods that they're passionate about, um, and that they thrive from, and they learn they learn from. So, um, I I want to. I want to build um, these organizations into something that endures past my my life, and is not dependent upon me, um, and uh, and that's my goal. Um, so I don't have a goal of creating new businesses. Um, but again, I never want to create a business in the first place. I, I just wanted to serve these ideas um, that I had, Thank and uh, it's worked out. Yeah. Another question from Twitter. Just one more, and then we'll go to ones in the room. Um, okay. So a bit more specific. Um, an intriguingly named Evening Bear has sent in a question for you, and it goes back to Bitcoin that you were speaking about. They've asked, is Bitcoin compatible with capitalism? Um, the idea behind it is noble, but don't you think it is held hostage by the current system? Um, <clears throat> I, I don't think it's held hostage by the current system. I think it will change the current system. I think it will evolve the current system. Um, in positive ways. I mean, again, I, I'm an optimist, so I, I want to. I don't want to. I don't want our company, and I don't want myself to wait for things to happen. I want to help make them happen, in positive ways, and have positive outcomes around them. So, Bitcoin could be um, disastrous if we don't focus on making it something that adds to society and enables uh, more um, help, helpful movements in, in society. So. Uh, that's my mindset, and as long as we have consensus around that, then I think it's I think it's quite positive. But I do think it'll evolve how we think about capitalism, and 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 more broadly how we interact with one another, uh, and uh, and society uh, at large. And I, I think there are, there's going to be more positives than than negatives, but there will certainly be negatives too. Okay, questions from the audience. Let's start with this gentleman in the brown jumper. Jack Tamim from UCL Center for Blockchain Technologies. Um, with the fourth industrial revolution um, coming into play, hopefully, and to enable Internet of Things, I kind of see Twitter being a great enabler of that. Do you ever see Twitter turning into a blockchain platform? We weren't going to mention the oh, two okay. words. Um, the, the reason we're not we're, we're not talking about Twitter is, is the square focus, but. More broadly, like I, I think uh, to the to the question is, um, I think blockchain has application for so many different types of technologies, and so many different types of services. So, um, I I imagine every company can utilize it to make themselves better, and that's Square, and that's Twitter, and that's any other company that you can imagine. Um, so, we don't want to apply technology for te applying technology's sake. We want to make sure that we're using it because it solves uh, a problem in a in a in a unique way, in a creative way, um, but so the answer is 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 yes. Um, like it can help with with trust, and it can help with um, identity. Um, but we need to really study the technology, and then more importantly, understand what problems we're trying to solve, and if it actually helps us solve those problems in the most innovative way possible. Just that in the front. Yeah. Thank you. And then this side hands up. Okay. Cool. Uh, yeah, Jack, uh, Osmond here from Tech Citizen Meetup. Uh, from your talk, thanks for coming and thanks Anne-Marie as well. Uh, 
because uh, I had the London tech ecosystem. Now I know that virtually every city in the world is trying to develop its own tech ecosystem. And I know Silicon Valley is the, the center and everyone's trying to compete or compare themselves just to Silicon Valley. You seem to have experience of Silicon Valley and outside. Can you give us some tips on how we can develop the system better? Developing what system in particular? Just ecosystem. Oh, the ecosystem, the ecosystem. Okay, okay. Um, well, I mean, I think first and foremost is not, like Silicon Valley works because of a, of a particular collection of um, uh, particular um, occurrences that, that happened in the past that set up this, um, these circumstances that made it easy for uh, folks to build these technologies. Um, but it was very unique to that, um, to that area. And if we spend too much time trying to replicate what happened in Silicon Valley, we miss out on the opportunity and the circumstances and the environments and the culture uh, that makes something like London great, right? So um, we, um, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I would certainly learn, but like I would not try to replicate any of Silicon Valley actually. Um, I would find what's unique about where we are here and what, and what culture, what, what this culture, um, how it applies to, how it thinks about certain problems and how it, um, uh, how it uh, addresses those problems in, in creative ways. So um, the, the, the ecosystem develops to me um, in the same way that open source did by showing off what you're doing. And other people, sometimes it resonates and sometimes it doesn't, but those who resonate with it, they, they wanna join forces and they wanna work together and they wanna, or they have an idea. So to me, the, the thing that works more than anything else is just being open, but also finding your unique uh, identity um, within, the, you know, within the area that you're in. What do you love about the London tech scene? Um, well, I, you know, I, I think it's, uh, one, like, you know, some of the best machine learning and deep learning folks in the world are here in London. Um, and I don't know the conditions that created that, but it is what it is. And um, everyone I meet um, in that space is very confident that it's the best in the world. And I love that. Um, I, I think, you know, it defines what, what, London, what London is. And um, I, I think that's something to really lean in and, and, uh, and, to, uh, and to help divine the, um, technology within within the space but openness and, and just constant conversation about um, hey we're trying to build this and we're having these problems and what problems are you seeing you know the, the meetups that you're doing are, are really important and uh, and um, and something I would I would continue but I would not I would I would look more deeply at ourselves instead of look at like Silicon Valley Okay. <coughs> Emma and then the man in the purple scarf. Thank you. Uh, welcome to London. I feel as if we're the corner that's hogging all the questions. Uh, I would love to know, you spoke at the start about being comfortable with risk and you said this is one of the features that entrepreneurs should have. You didn't want to be an entrepreneur, you didn't want to start businesses. Were you comfortable with risk from the very beginning or is this something that you've built over time? Uh, no, I wasn't comfortable with risk. Um, I... I guess another way to say it is I, I've always I've always learned best when I put myself in very very uncomfortable situations. Um, so that's what I seek out is like what is going to make me uncomfortable, um, and that started when I was a kid. Like I uh, I had a speech impediment when I was a kid, so I had to go to the therapist. I I basically couldn't talk because uh, I, I could not pronounce any of my words. No one understood what I was saying, and I still have problems with that. I still catch myself. Um, Bef sometimes before I say it, sometimes after I say it, mispronouncing in significant ways, which changes the whole meaning of what I was trying to say. And that made me very, very, very shy. So I became very reserved, very withdrawn. Um, I wouldn't talk with anyone because I wasn't confident in my ability to actually express what I was intending to express. So around fourth or fifth grade, I decided that this is dumb. Um, and I need to like change. Uh, so I signed up for the speech class and the debate class and I could not imagine something more scary at that particular time than getting in front of someone and talking or even talking in a small group of three people. But I forced myself to do it 
And it was even worse because these speech classes are like torture. Um, because what they do is they, they do this torturous thing where they give you a word and they give you five minutes to come up with a whole speech about it. And then you have to actually get up there and talk about it like you're an expert. And then they judge you as well. And it was, it was just a nightmare. I was dreading it. But uh, I embraced it and I learned how to do it. And um, that allows me to do what I'm doing right now, uh, which when I, was, uh, when I was young, no way in hell <laughs> I would do this. And I still, you know, I still have those, those feelings. But I know I need to do this. I know I need to do this because it's important to advance what we're trying to do um, at my companies. Um, it's important to tell our story. Uh, and it's important that, um, to, to listen and, and to constantly evolve that story as well. So that, that is the mindset. It's not necessarily, I don't think about, I need to take this risk. It's, this makes me really uncomfortable. Why? Um, and is there something interesting there? And, uh, and, and that's always led me to a really amazing answer. Very interesting presentation, particularly the uh, subject of lending money. Um, I own one of the largest shadow banks in Latin America. Um, how do you deal with regulators? That is the problem that I am confronted day in, day out. Bitcoin, you know, is down to 8,000 because of regu regulators. All the other uh, cryptocurrencies have the same problems. Any money lending activity or any uh, transaction regarding transfer of funds, we are confronted with very uh, difficult um, uh, requirements from the regulators, uh, not only locally but internationally. How do you see that developing? Because they are an important element, and yeah. they are very concerned about shadow banking as well. Yeah, and so that, that's the key is they are an important element. And their, their job is to ensure fairness and to protect individuals. And coming at it with that understanding, um, then you get to a mindset of like, okay, so we need to not resist regulators, but we need to help educate. We need to help educate about what technology can make possible um, and what the constraints are and what the bounds of the, those technologies are. And taking on that mindset instead of like, we're going to resist or we're going to uh, worry about it, um, or we're going to uh, do everything that we can to not be regulated, I, I think is a, a, losing, a losing battle. Um, we instead need to really make sure that first, our, the goal is clear, uh, and then second, um, how are we educating the regulator, uh, and how are they providing the right checkpoints to make sure that there is fairness, and they're not being influenced by any one particular party to an outcome to protect something that already exists, but they're being influenced uh, by a goal of protecting the individual and ensuring fairness in a level playing field. So as long as we're good with that, then um, I think uh, the job becomes much um, clearer, not necessarily easier, um, but you know, one of the things that I've learned, we deal with a lot of regulation with, uh, with Square, um, and uh, patience uh, is really important. Uh, repetition <laughs> is really important. Um, and, and not not in a condescending way, it's just, it's really important that we, we constantly show why this matters um, and what we can do. And we, we are clear about our goal of, we are here to provide more access to more people. And this current regulation is stopping us from doing that. Um, and here is how we achieve the goal of protecting the individual and ensuring fairness, while at the same time, enabling more people to come onto the system. We did this, uh, with one of our one of our technologies, which was a mobile pin, um, so we enabled people to enter in a pin on a mobile phone, which was um, against uh, a lot of these rules. We challenged that. Um, we showed uh, why this is a lot more secure and how we can move it much faster. Uh, and ultimately, um, we were able to push it through. Um, and I think it bettered the entire industry because of that, because hardware is very hard to change quickly. And there are inherent security risks in putting something out that is all hardware-based. If we can do it in software, we can move it much faster. Uh, and we can protect people um, in, a, in a stronger way. Um, so just by constantly enumerating and being patient with, uh, as, as you educate anything, or you, you, you try to learn anything, you always need patience. Um, so that, that has been the, the biggest lever in, in my own personal experience about dealing dealing with regulators and working with regulators. Okay, so the lady 
Oh, no. Yes, yes. The lady in black in the end. And then we'll go up. Um, hi, Jack. Uh, you follow me on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because we are part of an international network, I am Tech Inclusion, along with Wayne Sutton, who I know you know very well. We invited you over at Christmas, but you didn't hear us. Um, did you me over here? Yeah, we did. We invited I was in a 10-day silent meditation retreat, so I definitely did we not found your <laughs> We found your tweet saying, I'm going offline, which made us all chuckle, but happy Christmas. Um, how do you see Square in Africa? in those places where the second and the third technological revolution has completely missed? And where do you see it in the future in bringing tech inclusion to the world? Sophia Cannon, tech inclusion. Hmm. The, um, so it's it's one of my questions actually, M-Pesa was another thing I was gonna, I was gonna mention, because you've, you've yeah. come to the UK, but you haven't gone to anywhere on the continent. So yeah. what are you waiting for? Um, well, I don't, I, I, I don't believe we'd add any value right now. Um, I, I think M-Pesa is extremely innovative in, in, uh, in an entirely new model where, where we wouldn't add anything above and beyond that at the moment. We're certainly open to opportunities, but um, we, uh, we only have so, mo so many resources and we, we're still in a phase where we need to build strength where we can um, serve more of the world. Um, but I would love to be um, in so many countries in Africa, I would love to be in India, I would love to be in China. Um, but a lot of these uh, countries have developed things that are very unique uh, to them and extremely creative and extremely innovative that are working. And I would hate to be a company that just comes in uh, and, um, and ask people to do in a different way because it's our business model. I would really want to study what works and what the gaps are and figure out if we can if we can help and we're not going to displace any local momentum. Um, so there is a ton of local momentum around around payments in, in all over Africa that I think is we're actually learning from um, rather than you know coming in and, and, and mandating a, a certain way of doing things that, that we don't. So um, one of the things I am trying to do though is I, I do believe that the more we can share our stories on stages like this with entrepreneurs who are just getting started um, and don't see a lot of folks from, from companies that have been fortunate enough to achieve our level of success um, actually going to those conferences. So um, uh, at least once a year, I'd love to do it more often. I've been going to technology conferences um, that serve those uh, entrepreneurs. So the last one I did was in Jamaica. Uh, it was called Tech Beach. Yep. And the one I'm doing this year is in Haiti. Um, which I'm really excited about. So um, I want to I want to be able to um, at least be present and uh, listen and, and also share my own stories of success and failure to these entrepreneurs who don't don't often get a chance to um, uh, to to hear the stories directly from from companies that have uh, achieved the, the success we've been able to achieve. So yes, yes. Yes, I will come. Okay, all right. Thank you. So we have sadly run out of time, so we're not quite going to get to head straight up the stairs, but don't let that colour the feedback that you leave on the feedback form um, that is underneath all of your seats. So please, please fill in this feedback form. It's really important um, for the British Library, but also for yourselves, because you could win £1,000 worth of fee-free transactions on Square if you fill it in. So it's not quite a grand... That didn't work. I thought people would laugh. You didn't, you didn't get that. Um, you don't win a grand, just a disclaimer. You win a thousand pounds worth of fee free transactions on Square, but also the reader, if you fill in this feedback form, so please hand it to someone um, on the way out. Um, I want to thank Jack for being truthful thank you. and honest with most of his answers. Um, <laughs> I want to thank you for being a fantastic audience. I want to thank the people in Manchester and Worcester and also on the live feed on Twitter for following along. If you did have a pressing question, maybe tweet it to Jack. I can say that word now because we finished the interview. Um, and he maybe will answer. He may not. I guess look through the hashtag, Jack. Be, uh, be generous with your 140 characters. Um, and I think 
we'll leave it there. There are the drinks, as um, suggested earlier, out in the theatre on the way out, and we will be doing some networking, because that's another feature that we have at the Business and IT Centre, networking masterclasses, um, so you can learn to do that. Jack, are you joining us for a drink? I'll join for one drink. Just for one drink. <laughs> Only the one. Don't all pile on at once. Try not to talk to him about Twitter. My final question I'm going to ask as we close this. Um, what is your favourite social media platform? <laughs> There's only one. <laughs> That's Twitter. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you all.